This is a little bit of vocab, but it's kind of a, a straightforward type of a section that builds pretty nicely on what we've been talking about before on uh, coordinate systems and coordinates and bases. So I think you're in for a little bit of a treat here, like a real nice shindig. I hope y'all enjoy what we're about to do um, as we try some of those newfangled dimension things and try to organize all this stuff in the right ring. So here we go, and let's leave off the bad accent. So intro. These sections are focusing on a number of characteristics of common subspaces. Uh, just a reminder, what are the common subspaces that we've been talking about so far in this class? We've got about three or four. So we've talked about uh, RN. Good. We've got, come on, little buddy. We've got the null space. Got the column space. Now look at my comments are approximately. You see this? Uh, we've got. I think there was one other one that we've talked about a whole bunch from Evan. The polynomial space. We got PN. Okay. And uh, the homework also talks about the row space. And you could talk about these as all general cases of vector spaces, uh, V, if you will. So thanks everybody for your contributions there. So, so we're talking about characteristics like uh, of these types of subspaces. And the characteristics we're gonna talk about are dimension, rank, we'll talk about nullity, and then we'll also introduce the, the row space so if a vector space V has a basis B equal to B1 da, 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 to Bn, then any set in V containing more than N vectors must be linearly dependent. Okay. So notice uh, that if B is a basis, what are the two qualities of a basis? So I've got li and span. Okay. And so when it says that any set of v containing more than n vectors must be linearly dependent, what it's saying is if you add an extra vector in there, you're going to have too many vectors. So it will still span, but they will no longer be linearly independent. So maybe you could think about theorem nine as being the too many vectors theorem. Is the audio working for everyone? It looked like somebody had a question earlier. Everybody, you good now, Kyle? Perfect, perfect. All right, so theorem 10, if a vector space V has a basis of N vectors, uh, again, basis, that means linearly independent and span of N vectors, then every basis of V must consist of exactly N vectors. So if one basis has N vectors, all bases are gonna have N vectors. So, or if you will, all bases have the same number of vectors. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that the basis for R2 has the same number of vectors as the basis for R3. I'm saying all bases for one space are gonna have the, the same number of vectors. 
So a definition, if V is spanned by a finite set, then V is said to be finite dimensional. And the dimension of V written as dim V um, is the number of vectors in a basis for, uh, for V. So the dimension of the zero vector space, zero is defined to be zero. If V is not spanned by a finite set, then V is said to be infinite dimensional. Uh, and I think we are gonna basically not talk about these guys. So, okay. all right. So, um, let's see. Basically, the dimensions are dimension of V or dim V is the number of vectors in a basis of V. So let's look at example one. So if we want to find the following, if we want to find the dimension of Rn, you think about it, you could say that a basis for Rn would be like E1, E2, all the way to En. And so there's n vectors in one basis, which means there's n vectors in all bases, which tells you the dimension of Rn is just n. How about the dimension of P3? What's the dimension of P3? We've got from Alex and from Ryan and from Felix, Megumi, Ratana, Gurley, and from lots of you, the dimension of P3 is four. And that's because there's one, two, three, four basis elements are uh, in this case. And so if there's four elements in one basis, there would be four elements in all bases, though the dimension is four. How about the dimension of Pn? Yep, just like you're saying, it's gonna be n plus one. And you can see it up here, you had three was equal to, here was the three and here was the three plus one, it gave you the four. And in D, this is our one example that we have of an infinite dimensional space. And the reason is because in this case, remember that this P here is, is all polynomials. So we're no, whereas before we had PN and so we were limiting ourselves. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, we were limiting ourselves to N dimensional polynomials, like a fixed size. Now we're saying they could be of any dimension. Um, I think most of you have had calc have had calc three. And so in calc three, you do things like, uh, you would say something like e to the x is equal to the sum, gotta remember what this would be, it'd be like, I think we had x to the n over n factorial from n equals zero to infinity. I think that was our Taylor or Maclaurin series. I recall right. So here would be another example of like an, a polynomial. It's a polynomial, but it would be of infinite length. Okay. 
questions so far? So suppose that we have a space H that's made up of the span of one, two, three, and four, five, six. And what I want to point out here is that these things are not scalar multiples. So yellow, so blue is not a number times the yellow, right? So, so that tells you that these are linearly independent. So what would be the dimension of this space? So the dimension of this space would be two. Okay. If we had G, which was one, two, three, and then we had two, four, six. So notice it's the same yellow one, but now what's the relationship between the yellow and the green? Yeah, it's times two. The green one is exactly double the yellow one. So the two vectors are linearly independent. Thanks. Looking back, I've got Ratana and Felix and Ben, Juan and Gerald and Tommy and Hui. Lots of people chimed in here. So um, they're linearly de dependent. And so in this case, how many linearly independent vectors are there in this space? So there's only one linearly independent vector. So we would say that our dimension of this space is just one. What's the dimension of the column space? Uh, question was, uh, okay. uh, the question was, is the dimension the same or equal to the column space? Um, no. So the dimension is a number. So the dimension equals, well, I guess it could be infinity, but it's just a number, it's like one, two, three, something like that. Whereas the column space is equal to a set of vectors. Um, uh, set of x. And unless it's the zero vector, there's always, unless we're talking about the zero vector, it's always going to be an infinite number of vectors. So, uh, so the question was, is the dimension equal to the number of linearly of vectors in the column space? No, it would be the equal to the maximum number of linearly independent vectors in the column space. Because the maximum number of linearly independent vectors would form a basis, and the number of vectors in the basis is equal to the dimension. Did that answer your question, Croy? Cool. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, before. Before we go on, I wanted to take a little uh, time out and do a do a commercial break, right? Uh, we've just been doing too much math today with all of this adding to three stuff. Um, so we have T here from the Math Resource Center just coming to talk to us again about some of the resources that are available to her or to us. Um, so. Uh, T, would you be interested in sharing for a bit? All right. Hi. Sorry for the drop in on this time, but um, yeah, industry say um that maybe some students are late, so I think I will drop in like a middle class so all student here, so I can tell you guys um remind you about um the Mass Resource Center. And um, we are always available for you to come and um, help with your 
homework question or you have any question that you cannot um, discuss with your teacher if he busy, um, we are available for you to come and we can work together with your assignment. So um, I just want to remind you a little bit about our page. So um, here, uh, when you come to mrc.highlight.edu, here the main page of um, Mass Resource Center. So here you can see um, the tutoring schedule or make appointment right here. So right here we have name of the person who is tutor in Smart Resource Center. And right here you can click on the I button right here. You can see um, what all, these, the all level of the tutor can, can help you. And when you try to choose a tutor right here, here the schedule you can pick up. So here the day trend is working and the hours and then your details, your name, email, and student ID, what you need help. So here, uh, um, and make sure you put the right email so um, the Mass Resource Center can send you the Zoom link so you can join. Um, so make sure that you have a right account so we can send you um, the right Zoom link. So yeah, and um, after you have the Zoom link, you can click in when you um, on your time appointment and meet with your um, tutor. So you can get help from your tutor. Um, so I believe that um, on the tutors, all the tutors, only me right here and Tren um, already taken um, 220 class. So if you need help with your class, you can um, make appointment with Tren on me um, right here. So when you click on our name, the schedule will be right here. So this. This is the available day and time. You can click in if you want and you need help. Okay. Um, yeah, I just coming back and remind you all that we are always available for you to come and work together. Um, yeah, that's it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dusty. For Thank me you come. for coming in. Yeah. Okay. Have a good day. You as well. Take care. I think one of the, the big takeaways for me in the pandemic has been that there actually are a lot of resources available to, to me as a teacher, to you as students, to, you know, to family members. The hard thing is, is that we have to take advantage of them. They don't, they don't just land in our lap. We actually have to take the initiative and um, it can sometimes just be hard to, to reach out when, when we need help. So whether it's, uh, you know, if you're uh, stymied on your homework or under, and you want to talk to somebody else taking advantage of the Math Resource Center, or uh, maybe you're having a hard time getting out of bed in the morning and you need to talk to somebody, we need to, you know, maybe you'd like to talk to a counselor or something like that, or you've got resource issues and we could connect you to other things. Like there's lots of resources available, but you sort of have to ask and we got to be able to, um, you know, connect you to those things. So I'm glad that T could come back in and share, share a little bit more. All right, let's continue in section four, five and four, six talking about the dimension of a vector space and the rank. So I'd like to start by doing an example where we find the dimension of a subspace. And so, come on little buddy. So our subspace is described as the set of all vectors of this given form where A, B, and C are in R. So this is our space H right here. And so we can rewrite H in, in, a, in a more familiar manner. 
So we could think about this and say, well, there's A's and there's B's and there's C's. So how much A is there? Looks like we got one, two, negative one, negative three. how much A, and then how much B. So all of our vectors in H have this form right here. So we could also say, could say that uh, these vectors span H. So our question is asking us to find the dimension of the subspace H. And so we just said that H is equal to the span of these three vectors. So can we just stop and say the dimension must be three? Are, are we done? I've got some no's. What do we have to address, Abed, Felix, Ben? Why are you saying no? Yeah. So. These vectors clearly span, but we're not sure whether they are linearly independent. In order to be a basis, they have to span and be linearly independent. So how do we test for linear independence? Okay. So from Ahmed, we're gonna, and from others, we're gonna ref it. And what are we gonna look for when we ref it? We're gonna look for the pivots. That's right, too. So we've got this matrix. and we ref it. And when I refed it, I got one, zero, negative two, zero, one, zero, and then a whole bunch of zeros. So what does this tell us? It tells us we have the two pivots right there, right there. And so we've got two pivots, which in turn tells us what? Yeah, it tells us that these two columns here, the first two, are going to be linearly independent. Uh, the third one. Um, when you could actually see it, it would be this one right here is negative two times column one. Okay. It was linear, that's a linearly dependent column. So let's go back to the question. Question says, find the dimension. Do we now have an answer to our question? Yeah, so now we can answer our question. There's two linearly independent columns. Uh, so our basis is uh, columns one and two. And so the dimension 
of h equals 2. Question so far? So let's talk about this graphically just for a moment. So we can now uh, talk about subspaces of, say, for example, R3. And so the subspaces of R3 can now be classified by dimensions. So if you have a line, the line is going to be one dimensional. If you have just the origin, just the point, a point is zero dimensional. A plane is going to be two dimensional. And if you fill out the whole space, then you're going to have three dimensions. So we can now make sense to talk about a two-dimensional subspace of R3. Let me change colors. Something like that. All right, so let's look at this theorem 11. Um, I think. The theorem is intuitive, and there's something a little bit different in this proof, which is why I wanted to, to do it, um, to prove it. So theorem 11 says, let H be a subspace of a finite dimensional vector space V. Any linearly independent set in H can be expanded, if necessary, to be a basis for H. Also, H is finite dimensional, and the dimension of H it's less than or equal to the dimension of V. So let's let's make sure that you're trapped. Let's do a little bit of scratch work on the side so you can see what's going on. So suppose that our V, our big space, is equal to R3. So if our big space is equal to R3, and suppose that uh, how does it um, H is equal to the span of, let's make it easy, just one, zero, zero. Okay. So any linearly independent set in H can be expanded. So do we have a linear, what's a linearly independent set in H? just be it's just one vector right so what there's only one linearly independent vector um, and so we can expand this to create um, ah 
I have. To, I'm sorry. I need to update what I said. So I had to add another one. So I want to make h um, h is a the dimensions of h are two. So a linearly independent set in H is this one. So one zero zero is linearly independent within H. Is it a basis? It's just it's just that one vector of basis. I've got lots of no's. Thanks, everybody. Uh, ben, Evan, Andrew, Gerald, Alex. No, um, it's the set is linearly independent. What characteristic is missing? It doesn't span. So what we could do in order to span is we could add on another vector. We could add the green one, or maybe we could add a, another you know, maybe I'll add uh, zero two zero just for the, so it's a little bit different. So I've added another vector, it's linearly independent. And so now the, uh, and so now we have between the orange and the purple, we now do have a basis. Okay. So that's, that's what's going on in this particular theorem is it says we can expand here's my expanded expand by adding another vector to make it work so let's look at our proof our theorem let h be a subspace of a finite dimensional vector space b any linearly independent set in H can be expanded, add the purple ones, if necessary, to a basis for H. Also, H is finite dimensional, and the dimension of H is less than or equal to V. So here's our claim. So for our proof, we need to address a couple of different um, a couple of different cases. So the first case we have to address is. Uh, what if our space is the tr is really trivial? So case one is what if H is just the zero vector? Okay. So how many linearly independent vectors are there in this subspace? There are no linearly independent vectors. So when the, when the theorem says any linearly independent set in H, there are no linearly independent sets in H. So it's kind of like a boring, a boring little enactment of that part. So it can be expanded. So we're not going to expand anything. And so we also have to talk about the dimension of H less than or equal to the dimension of V. So what's the dimension of H here? So the dimension of H is going to equal zero. And it should be clear that we don't know what's going on with V, but certainly zero is going to be less than or equal to the dimension of V, regardless of what your V is. That's your case one, kind of your boring case. Case two. So if we let H be a subset that includes linearly independent vectors, we don't, we got to just make some up. So let H be 
I said subset, I meant subspace, but HBA subspace that includes linearly independent vectors uh, V1 to VK. So there's a couple of different options. So these are linearly independent vectors. So one option is that it's not a, um, it might not be a basis. So if, um, if this set, we wanna talk about the set. So maybe let's give it a name. call it S. So if S uh, is not a basis, okay, so I have a set of linearly independent vectors. If it's not a basis, which characteristic is missing? It's missing. So it's they're linearly independent, it's not a basis, so they must not span. Thank you, Ryan, Twe, and others. So if S is not a basis, then they must not span um, H. So if it doesn't span the space, then that means there's vectors that we can find vectors that are in H that are not in the span. Um, so, so there is a VK. And what are the characteristics of this VK? It's going to be in H. And the VK is not going to be in the span of S. But this means that. Uh, this means that the set V1 all the way to VK, ooh, I'm sorry, this is VK plus one. And then I can tack on, I can expand with a VK plus one. is linearly independent. Yeah, thank you, Evan, for that correction. Okay. So we've expanded. Maybe we've got something that is a basis. So if it we're basically going to continue this process as long as the set does not spin. And as soon as you find a set that spans H, where you can't add another linearly independent vector, okay, then you will have, um, and then you will have a basis.
as a corollary of this, we have that the dimension statement is true. So there's two features of this proof that I want to highlight. So two features. If I can spell. The first one is you have this idea of cases. We we deal with this. Here's, in this case, we do such and such. In this other case, we do such and such. Um, cases aren't very fun in math, but they do come up, and you kind of got to be aware that sometimes you have to deal with it that way. Oftentimes, it's like this where you'll have like a trivial case, like a really simple case, and then you'll spend most of your time on the longer case. The second thing that I want to point out here is that this is what's called a constructive proof. Or, and so basically what we did in the proof is we said, if it doesn't work, then we're going to expand in the following ma manner. We created, we basically added to it and then we tried it again. So we were iterating. Um, and so that construction is happening right here. We take that, we take the old set and then we find this new vector, we just add it to the set and then we try it over again. And if it works, we're done. If it doesn't work, we do the process over again. We add another one to the set and, uh, and see what happens. So it's kind of like a constructive proof. This is different than an if and only if, or an if then, or a, contradict proof by contradiction or something along those lines. It's just kind of like a different style of proving. Um, yeah, and then there's one other word in here that I want to make sure you point out. A, a corollary, a corollary is like a, can you, can you, anybody have a good definition for, for the word? It's like, I think if I can, It, so it's it's the dictionary says it's a forming a proposition that follows from one already proved so it's like um it's like um like it, yeah it follows from like it's like a it's not the exact same thing but it's a side statement that follows from the thing that you've just shown. something along those lines. So we have this, this next theorem and I was planning on proving it, but I actually, as I thought about it, I was like, I'm actually not gonna prove this one. Proof is in the notes, the proof is in the text. I wanna actually talk about this one and make sure that you under, understand what it says, because it's actually a really handy theorem. So I don't want you to lose track of the power of this because we're doing a proof. So theorem 12, the basis theorem. So let V be a p-dimensional vector space with p greater than or equal to one, 
Uh, any linearly independent set of exactly p elements in V is automatically a basis for V. Any set of exactly p elements that spans V is automatically a basis for V. So let's make sure that you're tracking what's going on. So a basis has uh, for uh, for V where the dimension of V equals P has what two characteristics? So what are the two characteristics of a basis that we've been talking about? Evan and Gerline and Kevin and Twee and Ben. It's linearly independent and spans. Okay. And what this particular theorem says is that these two, like this is our definition, a basis is linearly independent and spans, but we have a couple other ways of accomplishing the same thing. We could say, that is linearly independent and there's p vectors. Like this is enough to also know we have a basis or it spans and p vectors. So if you will, oh, um, we get a decent, thank you. So some, some people are in the waiting room. Thanks for that. So we now have three ways of showing that we have a basis. Okay. So way one to show something as a basis is we could show that it's linearly independent in spans. That would be enough to tell us we have a basis. Way two to show we have a basis is to show that it's linearly independent and there's p vectors in that space. And way three to show we have a basis is to show that it spans and again that we have p vectors. Think, I think it's clear why this is true, but maybe, maybe what's clear to me is not clear when you first see it. So at the risk of, of overstating things, the reason this works is that if I have P linearly, if I have linearly independent vectors and I have P of them and the dimension of my space is P, then those p vectors must also span the space. So the p vectors is enough to give me span. So I run, end up right back at linear, linearly independent and span. That's why this the two version works. The three version works because if it spans and I have, again, p vectors, that means there's the minimum number of vectors that could possibly span. Therefore, they must be linearly independent, span and linearly independent is enough to tell me I have a basis. That's why this works. Questions about the basis theorem? Very good. All right. So let's try to apply this to some of our familiar, uh, let's try to apply it to some of our familiar uh, situations. So let's talk about this in terms of the column space and the null space. 
So suppose we had some vector A and we're just gonna do an example. So if our A was maybe three by five, and we don't know what it is, it's got like A, B, C, D, E, It's very dangerous, but I'm going to actually use O there. Like that's the letter O, not zero, but whatever. And so then if you want to find the dimensions of the column space or the null space, you're going to, um, you're going to row reduce, right? And so we row reduce and we don't know exactly what we're going to end up with, right? Um, so suppose, um, well, but we do know a couple things. What's the most pivots that we could end up with? So most pivots, uh, Megumi, Alex, Felix, Twee, and others is three. What's the least pivots you could have? I've got ones and twos, and I'm claiming that those none of those are correct. I'm going with Ben on this one, and Andrew and Alex and Abed. That it's zero is the least pivots you could have. How would what would what kind of vector would A need to be in order to have no pivots? It could be the zero matrix, right? It's not very exciting, but but it would work. So that's the zero matrix. So we don't know what we're going to come up with. Let's just make one up just to. Uh, just to be able to have something to talk about. So suppose we row reduced and we ended up with, what do we end up with? K, L, M, N, O, I think we're up to P. P, Q, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, Q, I think we're up to R, 0, 0, 0. So suppose we ended up with this. It, there's lots of forms that this thing could take. Um, this, this is just one possible uh, way it could happen. So what can we say about the dimensions of the column space of A? So to look at the dimensions of the column space of A, what am I going to count here? I'm going to count, count the pivots, OK? And so we would say that the dimension um, uh, more space dimensions of the column space of A is equal to two in this particular case. And again, we just sort of uh, made it up. Uh, dimension of column space of A. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of writing. Like, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine characters. Like that is, that is not okay. So we want to make this easier. So we would say, this is the rank of A. Let's say the rank of A is two. So rank is the same as dimension of the column space. If you don't like it, you're like, why are they doing this? You're right. This definition stinks. This definition is rank, but it's kind of like, it is what it is. Okay, so how about the dimensions of the null space? What's my dimensions of my null space in this particular case? What do I want to count? Okay, I have lots of people saying pivots and then I have Felix saying other columns and maybe everyone's saying, and we're talking about saying free variables. So let's see if we can be a little bit careful with our vocabulary. What we wanna count 
are the columns without pivots, right? So we're trying to count this column, this column, this column, the columns without pivots. And in this case, that would be, that would be three. Okay. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a definition in just a moment. Again, dimension of null A equal to three. Oh, that's so much writing. So let's come up with a new term for this. Let's call this the nullity. I don't think that's actually any shorter than what I had written before, but it sort of is what it is. So two new words, rank and nullity. Rank is the dimension of the column space. Nullity is the dimension of the null space. So the dimension of the null space is, this is the nullity. And it's equal to the number of columns without a pivot. Or sometimes we like that free variable vocabularies. But remember, in order to in order to talk about free variables, we need an equation. So you could also say this is equal to the number of free variables free variables in and then we have to have ax equal to zero. So we got to turn it into an equation in order to talk about free variables. So that's pretty straightforward, I hope. And then the, the dimension of the column space, this is our rank, and it's just equal to the number of pivots. Questions so far? Ready to keep going? One thumbs up. Okay. So let's just do a, a quick example here. So if I wanted to de determine the dimensions of the null space and the column space of A, I've got some matrix A, we row reduce it and we see one, two, three pivots. So we would say that our rank, which is the dimension of the column space of A is three. And we see two columns without a pivot. And so we would say that our nullity which is the dimension of the null space of A is equal to two. And one thing you might notice is that here, you could say rank or you could say rank A. It kind of 
kind of like got a little bit of freedom in that particular notation. Questions? So let's just build up a, uh, th think about the subspaces that we've worked with a whole bunch. Um, we have kind of these subspaces that we've built with things like span or polynomials, but our big subspaces that we've been focusing in on or learning the most about are the null space and the column space. So let's build up a, another easy common subspace and that's going to be called the row space. Make sense? If you have the column space, you might wonder, well, what's the row space like? So the row space. So the set of all linear combinations of the row vectors of an M by N matrix A is called, believe it or not, the row space of A. And it's denoted cleverly as row A. Since there are n entries in each row, our row A is a subspace of R n. So if you have, make sure you're seeing this. If you have A is m by n, you have that the column space is a subspace of the number of R m and the row space is a sub, I'm going to use, this is the subset symbol, by the way, subset symbol of R n. Also, the row space of A would be the same thing as the column space of a transpose. Remember, transpose switches the, the rows and the columns of a vector. So if we wanted to, in example four, find a spanning set for row A, um, like, oh, a spanning set would be a set of vectors that spans the whole space. Let's not overthink. The four rows here would form a spanning set. So let's let's call these R1. And because it's the, the row vectors, I'm gonna use write them sideways. They don't, you wouldn't have to, but it seems like it's clear. So one, zero, negative three, one, two. And you might be looking at that and going, wait, is that one zero minus three one two or is that 10 and then a negative 312 we don't know what's going on so we're actually going to use commas with our row space just to make sure we can tell what are the individual entries Uh, another, so a couple just notational notes, and I, I'm, if I remember right, I'm trying to emulate the, what's going on in the book. So here, I'm using commas between the entries, and I'm also using parentheses instead of the brackets. If you leave off those commas, if you use brackets, not going to bother me. 
like I'm kind of okay either way. Um, but uh, trying to kind of go along with the book on this one a little bit. Okay. So if, if your homework, for example, screams at you, it could be that this is what it's looking for. So we want to find a spanning set. Uh, let's start questions actually asking for. And so we would say that our spanning set are these four, four vectors. So we would say that the row space of A is equal to the span of these four vectors. Here's, here's that spanning set. Questions? So R is a uh, so we asked, so R is a vector. So in this particular case, the R's are vectors, they're just row vectors. Yeah. So R i is the ith r the ith row vector. Good question. Other questions? Very good. All right. So I think there's kind of an obvious question about R1, R2, R3, and R4. Uh, ooh. And another question from Evan. I'll get there. I'll get to that in a second, um, Evan. So I think there's an obvious question about R1, R2, R3, and R4. Namely, do these uh, four vectors form a, what was, what's the other thing we've been talking about? So what are, were R1, R2, R3, R4, do they form, uh, what's our, what's our keyword that we've been working with for the last few days? Do they form a basis? Do they form a basis, right? And so clearly, because of the way they're constructed, clearly R1, R2, R3, and R4 are going to span the space, uh, are going to span the row space because that's what the row space is made from. But it's not clear yet whether they're linearly independent. Okay. So in this next uh, question, we take, we take that one on. And so I have, I believe the same matrix. So this A, uh, this A right here is the same A as below. And it's gonna blow your mind that our first step is to row reduce. So we take that matrix and we row reduce, and we now can focus in on those three pivots. So let's see what these three pivots do. Well, first of all, if we look at those three pivots, they tell us to look for or that our column space, um, so column space of A um, has a basis 
uh, where do we look for the original, where do we look for the column space? We look at the pivots and then what do I do with those pivots? From Matthew, or sorry, sorry from Ryan, Matthew, we look at the original, uh, the original. So we're going to take these guys, they're like, boo, 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 come over here and grab those columns. So it's going to have a basis. Oops. Come on. One, zero, negative three, two. And then we are second pivot is in the second column. So second column here and fourth column. Yeah, thank you, Sammy. Columns one, two, and four. That's exactly right. So we've got our basis for the column space. So now let's go and let's try to find a basis for the null space. So if we want a basis for our null space, um, So here we're going to look at the columns, uh, kind of like focusing in on the things that are uh, where there would be the free variables. Like uh, Gerald said, now we're going to focus in on the reft form. And so we're going to end up with vectors that have sort of focusing in here and here. So we've got free variables in the third and the fifth position. Um, have we have we done this enough that we can go straight from the ref version to the vectors or do we need to write it out? Can people see in what's going on here? I agree. Go straight there. Yeah, I'm cool with that. So from column three for the X3, we're going to switch the sign. So you're going to have three and then four. And then the free variable is x3. So since the free variables, ah, this is free variable is x3, you got to add a one. And then there's five components. And then in the x5, you're going to switch the signs. So you're gonna have negative four, five, two, zero. And because we're our free variables in the fifth column, I'll have a one in that fifth spot. Okay. So that's our null space. And so lastly, we wanna talk about this new thing namely the column space or the the row space hmm. drives me nuts um, and before i go there let's make sure you're seeing what happened so to find the column uh, the basis for the column space, we use the ref form, but then we looked back at the original, right? And to find the null space, we use the ref form, but we actually focused in on the ref form, right? So now when we're looking at the row space, we're going to again just look at the ref form. And so our basis here will be, and here's the crazy thing. Here, you could, you could go back to the original if you like, 
but what you can do is you can take the the rows the rows that have the pivots in them try not to write over everything the rows with the pivots will be your basis vectors here so we'll have one zero negative three that's really ugly looking sorry about the typesetting Something like that. Yeah. One of my secrets, Gerald, is to make sure that I give you the information after it becomes valuable to you. I wouldn't want you to um, have the homework be too easy for you. I, don't, I really don't like the way this it's like the overload works, but. These guys are those vectors. Uh, I believe we could use either version. There's a theorem. The answer to, to Gerald asked the question, this is already in the homework, laugh out loud, but my question is now, why do we use the ref version versus the original? And so I unintentionally skipped over this theorem. And so this theorem says that if two matrices A and B are row equivalent, then their row spaces are the same. If B is an echelon form, the non-zero rows of B form a basis for the row space of A as well as for that of B. Um, it makes sense that the right, it should make sense that the row reduced versions uh, are going to be a basis. Because think about what you do with row row reducing. You swap rows. That's sort of like a version of linear combination. We add rows, linear combination. We multiply rows by a scalar, that's linear combination. So the, the reft version is just linear combinations of the original. Um, and so that's why I haven't changed anything. Um, as I say it aloud, I don't think you could just look at this new matrix and go back and grab rows one, two, and three and have those form a basis. Um, let me see if I can. So you might say, well, why can't we do what we did before? Look at those three pivots and then go back and grab rows one, two, and three and use that. It could work, but it won't necessarily work. Um, let's see why. Imagine that we have a, like a super, um, super simple example. Suppose we had um, like A, B, 0, 0, C, D, right? And then we row reduced it and we ended up with 1, 0, 0, 0, sorry, 0, 1, 0, 0, just hypothetically, okay? If you did this and you wanted to find a basis for the row space, what we just said is you could take row one and row two, and those would form a basis for the row space. If you wanted to apply what we did before, you might say, wait a second, this is a pivot in row one. So I'm going to grab row one. 
this is a pivot in row two. So I'm gonna grab row two. But pretty obviously zero, zero is not going to work as a basis element. So this is an epic fail. Did that answer your question, Gerald? Other questions? Why did the sign change? So uh, Adis asked, why did the sign change? And I assume what you're talking about is that here we had um, like a negative three, negative four in our ref version and then here we have a positive three, four. Is that correct? Is that what the question is, Adis? Yes. Okay. So without writing it all out, remember to find the null space, you're, you're solving AX equals zero. And so at some level, what you're doing is you're gonna be taking that, that, that negative three represents a negative three X three and you would be adding it to the other side of the equation. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Cool, yeah, so it's, it has to do with the equation part and then the moving thing. So refer um, earlier if you need a more specific example there. Dusty, one of the, uh, one of the things we could do in the row radius was uh, to switch rows, right? So if that mm -hmm. happens uh, during row reduction, would that affect your answer? It's not going to aff affect my, um, no, short answer, no. So switching rows would not, is not going to affect the basis for the, for the row space. Um, did I answer your question, Navin? I mean, for the column space that you, you would pick up the, the ones that have the pivots. Oh, for the columns. We, we can't, remember, we can swap rows in the in row reduction, but we can't swap columns. And so the oh. columns, basically, you never cross those lines. So that's not going to mess up your column space. Oh. Yeah. Good question. Cool. All right. We've already done this. We already gave these definitions. So what do we call the dimension of the column space? What's our name for that one again? That's our rank. Yay. And what do we, um, what would be, what's the relationship? Oh my gosh, sorry. Let me just write this one because this is a little weird. So the rank is also the dimension of the row space of A transpose. Because remember, A transpose swaps rows and columns. So up here, you've got, here you've got column space. And then here I swapped rows and columns. And so those columns became rows. And so it all works. Um, what do we call the dimension of the null space? Call that one the nullity. Thank you, uh, Abed, Ryan, Gerlin, Abe. And I think this book is just using the dimension of the null space of A. So it's kind of like whatever floats your boat. Okay. So we now move on to the smelliest theorem of the entire class. This one definitely stinks. This is called the rank theorem. So the dimensions of the column space in the row space of an M by N matrix, A are equal. That's fine because we were just counting pivots. Uh, this common dimension, the rank of A also equals the number of pivot positions in A and satisfies the equation, the rank of A plus the dimensions of the null space of A equals N. So it's, Sure, check my colors. 
So this is saying rank plus nullity equals equals n. I keep making smell jokes about smell. Does do people understand why I'm making jokes about smell? I'm not trying to confuse people too much. All right. What's what's the joke, Megumi? Yeah. When something is rank, that means that it's stinky. So that's why I'm making jokes about smell all day. Um, so the number of pivots plus the number of columns without pivots equals equals n. That's exactly right. Yep. So we could prove it, but yeah, whatever. So if a is, for example, a I don't know, let's make it up, like a forty-two by thirty-five matrix. We'll try not to enter it into our calculator, um, but we did a whole bunch of stuff and. At the end of this, we found that there was a three-dimensional null space. Three-dimensional null space. And I want to know what's the rank. Um, so what would be the rank? Uh, let's make sure we figure out what are our rows and what are our columns here. So um, this has got to add up. This n here is the number of, of columns, right? So we have 35 columns in this particular case. And so like Abed, Evan, Gerald, and Gerline said, we would have uh, 35 minus 3 equal to a rank of 32, something like that. Good, because if three of them were used up for the null space, the column space, the rank, the dimensions of the row space, choose your label, they're gonna fill out the rest of them. Could a three by five matrix have a one dimensional null space? And we've got a, a no. I've got no's from Abed, uh, Ryan, and Gerline. Why? I agree. It's a no. Why? Why not? Yeah. So the column space can't be four. So maybe one another way of thinking about it is, if you've got three rows, there's at most. three pivots. So that tells you that your rank is going to be less than or equal to three. So if your rank is less than or equal to three, three plus one is rarely equal to five. Um, and so we're just kind of stuck with it the way it is. So I had a realization yesterday, namely that my notes were created in the previous edition of this textbook. And so they combined in the new version, they combined sections four, five and four, six. And so um, there's just a little bit of renumbering. It, it shouldn't impact you, but it may impact a few labels um, along the way. Let's see. So when last we were together, we were talking about our rank nullity theorem. And so our rank nullity theorem said that the rank plus the nullity was equal to the number of columns that are in a that are in a space. Come on. So we talked about that earlier. So picking it up in chapter six, we're going to learn that the row space and the null space have only the zero vector. In common. 
uh, and they're actually what we call perpendicular subspaces. I think if you went back and you grabbed, um, you looked at our example where we found the row space and the null space, you could, if you dotted those vectors together, you would see that the dot products were all zero. Oh, I also wanted to give a reminder, if you missed the Slack note last night, I posted the assessment five last night. And so it's available there for you already. All right, so let's look at a little example. So suppose that a scientist has found two solutions to a homogeneous system. When we say a homogeneous system, what are we talking about? Yes, yeah, so that'd be equal zero. So this would be the AX equals zero. Okay. So scientists just found two solutions to a homogeneous system of 40 equations in 42 variables. Uh, what are the dimensions of our A? So our A is gonna be how many rows, how many columns? I got 40 rows, one for each equation, and 42 columns, one for each variable. That's a terrible looking four. Okay. Sweet. So scientists just found two solutions to the homogeneous uh, system of 40 equations and 42 variables. The two solutions are not multiples, and all other solutions of the homogeneous system can be constructed by adding together appropriate multiples of these two solutions. Can the scientist be certain that any associated non-homogeneous system with the same coefficients has a solution? And the short answer is yes. And so all of this, this stuff up here, um, the two solutions two solutions are not multiples. All other solutions can be constructed by adding together appropriate multiples. All that stuff together is supposed to be telling us what? Um, so all that stuff is actually telling us about the nullity. You guys remember what the nullity is? Uh, thank you, Gerline and Felix. So it's telling us about the nullity. That's the dimension of the null space. And so this uh, first part says found two solutions tells us that the nullity is greater than or, and the two solutions are not multiples, tells us that the nullity is greater than or equal to two. And then come back here and says, all other solutions can be constructed by adding together those appropriate multiples. And so the combination says it's gonna just be equal to two. So then the question asks, can the scientist be certain that an associated non-homogeneous system has a solution? Let's see. Um, and so what can you tell me if we know the nullity is two, what else do we, do we know? We know that the rank must fill out the rest of the space. So that tells us, so remember, uh, uh, this is gonna tell us that all vectors, that yes, all vectors in R40, 
Okay. Remember, there's there's exactly 40 rows here uh, are in the column space of A. Okay. Because we're focusing on the fact that this is a 40, this is a 40, that's and up here we have a 40. So since we we know our rank is 40 and it matches the total number of components that tells us that we're going to we would have if you will a pivot in every row something like that. Questions? So I decided to do something new on the assessment this week. So one of the questions asks you to state the this invertible matrix theorem. That's this theorem right here. And this particular theorem actually started in, uh, I think it was section 2.3. So it's in 2.3 and it actually continues here and um, if you look through the notes and you read the notes carefully, you'll realize there's actually one other addition made to this invertible matrix theorem in another section, um, which is why the book and the notes are a little bit different in the number. So basically, I'm just saying list it all. So there's no, there's no math to do, just a lot of writing. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to the having some conversations and asking, you know, for people for their thoughts on the theorem, like how do these things connect and 